hygiene regulation students and welcome to the next lecture. This is the final lecture in part two on transcription and RNA processing. In this lecture, we will look at mRNA splicing and discuss the roles of the spliceosome, serine arginine proteins and exon splice enhancer elements. The next two objectives, which is to discuss how RNA is exported from the nucleus and the mechanism by which non-coding RNAs contribute to transcriptional regulation and post-transcriptional regulation, will be covered in part three. When genes are first transcribed into the primary mRNA transcript, Genes contain regions that code for proteins, as well as regions that are not translated from the mRNA. Regions that do not code for proteins are called introns, and this is due to the fact that they remain in the nucleus. Therefore, the name intron. Protein coding regions of mRNAs are those regions of the mRNA that will exit the nucleus, and therefore, these are called exons. Introns are removed in the nucleus before they are exported into the cytoplasm due to the fact that mRNAs are translated in the cytoplasm. Introns may contain stop codons, which would result in premature shortening of the protein product if they are present when the mRNA is transported into the cytoplasm. Therefore, introns are removed in the nucleus in a process called splicing. Most introns begin with a GU at the 5' prime splice site and an AG at the 3' prime splice site. So this means that an intron would begin with the nucleotides GU and end with the nucleotides AG. Studies that involve two exons and one intron have shown how an intron can be removed during the process of splicing. In these studies, it has been demonstrated that an intron emerges from between the two exons in a structure called a lariat. This lariat involves the formation of a bond between the 5' prime phosphate at the G residue with the 2' prime oxygen of an A residue. This A residue is called the branch point, and it is located 18 to 40 bases upstream of the 3' prime AG at the end of the intron. And this is what forms the lariat structure. So the intron is removed in two transesterification steps. And this means that it involves the formation of two ester bonds. The first ester bond is formed between the 5' prime phosphate at the G residue with the oxygen at the branch point. The second transesterification step involves the formation of an ester bond between the 3' prime hydroxyl group at the end of the first exon with the 5' prime phosphate group at the first nucleotide of the second exon. This results in release of the lariat or the intron and the formation of an ester bond between the upstream and downstream exons. The removal of introns is an enzyme catalyzed process and involves specific RNAs or proteins. These RNAs and proteins form a complex called the spliceosome. Now, if you were to think of the previous slide where we looked at how introns are removed in the lariat structure, the spliceosome is important due to the fact that it prevents dissociation of this complex. And therefore, the spliceosome is meant to ensure that the correct introns are removed and exon to exon ester bonds are formed in the correct place. The spliceosome is made up of at least five different RNAs and more than a hundred proteins. The RNAs that are present in the spliceosome are called small nuclear RNAs and they are rich in uridine residues. The spliceosome prevents exons from dissociating from the mRNA during the process of splicing. A spliceosome contains two subunits, a large and a small subunit. And if you look at this diagram of a spliceosome, 
which is the complex of more than 100 proteins as well as the small nuclear RNAs, there's a channel in the middle of this complex. And this channel is where the mRNA would bind to the spliceosome complex. We will now discuss how components of the spliceosome are involved in removal of introns. Small nuclear RNAs are associated with proteins called small nuclear ribonucleoprotein particles, or SNRPs. Due to the fact that these SNRNAs are rich in uridine, they are usually referred to by numbers U1 and U2, as well as the SNRPs that they are associated with. So the SNRPs are referred to by U1, U2, etc. as well. The first step in RNA splicing involves binding of SNRPs to the intron that is to be removed. And these SNRPs bind to the intron in a multi-step process. Intron removal begins with binding of the U1 SNRP to the 5' splice site. The U1 SNRP will bind between the 3' end of the upstream exon to the 5' prime end of the beginning intron. After binding of the U1 SNRP, the U2 SNRP is recruited to the A residue or the branch point. The U2 SNRP is recruited to the branch point via binding of U2 accessory factor, U2AF. So U2AF will first bind between the branch point and the AG residue and then recruit the U2 SNRP to the branch point itself. Following binding of U2, the U5 SNRP will bind to the upstream exon. Once U5 binds, it then recruits a single SNRP containing both U4 and U6 RNAs. This results in the dissociation of the U1 SNRP as well as the U4 RNA. So in this process, the U5 SNRP will then bind next to the U1 SNRP in the upstream exon. It will recruit a single SNRP that contains both U4 and U6 RNAs, and then the U1 SNRP becomes dissociated along with the U4 RNA. This results in a U6 SNRP remaining at the G residue at the intron splice junction. This U6 SNRP will then interact with the U2 SNRP, bringing the GU and the branch point into close proximity. This results in an ester bond being formed between the guanine residue at the 5' splice site with the branch point at the A residue. An RNA helicase called PRP22 will then bind to the downstream exon. PRP22 travels along the exon in a 3 to 5 prime direction. And as this helicase travels along this exon, it releases proteins that may be bound to this exon in the spliceosome. As the spliceosome proteins are slowly removed from the downstream exon, it will then encounter the three prime end of the upstream exon. An ester bond is then catalyzed between the upstream and downstream exons. Therefore, what remains is the mRNA containing the two exons bound to each other, followed by the intron removed in a structure called the lariat, that are still associated with these ribonuclear proteins. In addition to the SNRPs, other proteins in the spliceosome are called SR proteins. These proteins have been named SR proteins due to the fact that they are rich in serine and arginine residues. The SR proteins are not directly associated with small nuclear RNAs, like the SNRPs. However, the SR proteins are involved in directing SNRPs to the splice sites that are required to be joined to each other. SR proteins bind to exon splice enhancer elements within exons. So these SR proteins will bind to the exons.
and they play a role in directing which exons should bind to each other. The SR proteins ensure that exons are joined to each other sequentially. And so you don't have a process where we have an exon being skipped during the process of splicing. However, mutations in SR proteins can result in exon skipping. The SR proteins also play an important role in alternative splicing. So some RNAs can be used to produce multiple different proteins, and this involves the process of alternative splicing. Therefore, certain exons are intentionally skipped, and these SR proteins are involved in regulating that process. Now let's go back to talking about RNA processing. We've discussed that RNA processing involves both 5' prime capping, polyadenylation, as well as mRNA splicing. All three of these processes can be coupled with transcription. Therefore, RNA processing can occur during transcription. mRNA splicing can occur in two ways. Firstly, mRNA splicing can occur during the process of transcription. So as the primary transcript is being created, introns may be spliced out and exons can be joined to each other. A second manner in which RNA splicing can occur is after 5' prime capping and poly A tailing. So the entire gene is firstly transcribed. The 5' prime cap is added at the beginning of transcription elongation. And the poly A tail is then added after the transcript has been transcribed from DNA. And splicing can occur after this whole process. So there are two ways in which mRNA splicing can occur. So this summarizes the concept of RNA splicing. And in part two, we will then discuss the process of mRNA export and protein translation. Thank you.